afternoon, everybody. I'm Lisa Periquet, one of the co-founders of Art Fair Philippines. And I'd like to welcome you to our talks program. Uh, we just started today. Um, in case you don't know, it's our 10th anniversary <laughs> of the Art Fair. <laughs> and it's amazing to think we've come um, this, you know, along so far. Uh, when we started out, uh, we were, I think, only on one floor <laughs> in the car park. And now we're taking over so many. And the roof deck has really kind of grown into uh, a whole different space. But anyway, um, I'd like to welcome you today. Um, our talks are usually held here in this talks tent. It's our first time live after two years. So we're back here in the talks tent on the roof deck, and it's great to see everybody. And I think everybody's happy to see each other also at the fair. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce, uh, first of all, um, our educational partner, one of them, uh, who is the main partner, really, for our talks program. And that is the Atenea Art Gallery, which is uh, headed by Ms. Boots Herrera today, who will introduce the speakers and the moderator. Thank you, Thank you Lisa. Um, I didn't uh, realize it's the 10th anniversary. Wow. Uh, um, we came in 2017. No? So, OK, so um, this second session is a design panel. Uh, so it's a conversation with Andy Loxine, Russell Smith, David Sands, and Christian Salandanan. And to be moderated by Ms. Tina Bunoan, who I'll give a brief um, introduction, was the first editor-in-chief of Blueprint magazine. Um, it's still around, no? Yes. Um, so it's the Philippines' first and premier source book for architecture and design. Uh, in the 2000s, he, she served as former member of the Board of Directors of the UP College of Architecture Alumni Association and Vice President of the Heritage Conservation Society. And in recent years, she has explored jewelry design with her cutting-edge collections. I think she's wearing one now? No, pero maganda ang earrings mo. Okay, Tina, please. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're here. I'm here to introduce our speakers for this afternoon. We have our first speaker is Andy Loxin. He is the, yes, this is Andy. He is the administrator and design consultant of Leandro V. Loxin Partners. And he has helped establish the firm's governance and pol policy and to strengthen the training of his staff in terms of design because of his uh, training in the Harvard University. He has earned a degree in architecture. His master is in architecture. And he completed a double major uh, with, uh, of architecture and art history from the Wesleyan University in 1984. He is a young man. Andy, can you please show us what you have prepared for us on stage? You can introduce yourself again, too. Oh, okay. It's on. Hi, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here and uh, tolerating the heat. Uh, thank goodness it's absolutely freezing in here. So. Um, I was asked by the, the art fair folks uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, sort of what inspired and what was behind the design of the layout. As you all know, it's very different this year. Um, they asked me to try and keep it to five minutes. Um, I make no promises because some of you who know me better know that I'm a pretty long-winded guy. Uh, so uh, we'll see how, how well I do. Um, when, uh, when the art fair came out of the pandemic for the first face-to-face, um, they came to us in very short order and asked us to begin to think about uh, what, what this thing should be and uh, whether we go back to normal, so to speak. Uh, as designers within the firm, uh, both the interiors and the exteriors, we said it's so important actually that we recognize the moment we're all in and that the world we walk into is something quite different. 
Um, if that's not completely obvious to everyone, we are challenged, shall we say, by everything we do. And uh, we felt that it was really important to send the right messages. And uh, fortunately, the art fair people and us found ourselves completely aligned about doing something different. Okay? And uh, basically what it means was sort of a, a questioning, for instance, what, what we all do. What does art mean? Why do we come to art fairs? How do you build more resilient, a more resilient future? Uh, the things that we consider sort of uh, coming out of the pandemic. Um, we're at an inflection point, I think, worldwide in terms of uh, uh, what we should be doing looking forward. And uh, so we came up with this, this series of ideas and iterations. And um, it's, I guess, sort of it's been um, played out in the press to some degree, sort of this idea of biophilic forms. Uh, which we had been talking about uh, within the firm for a long time, and an idea we chose to, to adopt for the art fair because we thought it sent uh, really all the right messages uh, into, a, into the audience of the art fair. So I'll explain a little bit of, of what that all means, but it's impossible in five minutes. So I'll just try to sort of summarize in a very short form and then leave you at the end with an image. Some of you... Uh, who are more interested in sort of what it all means uh, with a link to a document that you can find online uh, and look into it a little further. But essentially, the idea of biophilic design uh, takes the viewpoint that uh, we human beings, as we operate uh, in the world and, and, and choose to what we, what we do and where we live, where we, where we work, uh, appreciate very much and take delight in uh, the forces of nature and the world that we all live in. Okay? And so the idea of introducing light, introducing the wind, natural forces, uh, sort of what you see outside your window, the shapes of the buildings, etc., don't even necessarily mimic, but sometimes are literally connected to nature. We all actually operate a little better. We, we, we are more efficient. Uh, our mind is more at rest, uh, have a, a greater sense of wellness. It's a gigantic subject all over the world, and it's, it's existed for many, many years, going back to medieval times. Okay? So this is not a new, this is not rocket science, except today in a more articulate world and in a more connected world, it's become sort of a, a little bit of a tagline. Okay? So I'll just take you through very, very briefly some images uh, in, in the hopes that sort of you, you will get a little bit of this sort of idea of what biophilic design uh, entails. It's much, much more complicated than what you see at the art fair. This is merely a very small portion of it. Biophilic design is actually very deep, very long, and has a very long history. So, um, oops. Um, you know, it goes back to things like the traditional Japanese house. Uh, in traditional Japanese house very often uh, presents this idea of shake. Basically, it's called, it's, it's sort of a, a concept of borrowed landscape or borrowed scenery, where in fact the scenery that you see outside the house actually can change. It morphs, uh, it's not static. And as you move those screens and you change the walls of the house, different scenery and different landscape come into view and inform actually the environment that you actually operate in. It lets in light, lets in air. You have access to the outdoors, and your general being, your your general feeling of, of well-being, uh, is tremendously enhanced. Um, that is one one form of it. Another is actually taking literally pieces of the landscape, what you see in nature, geological forces, and incorporating it actually into the man-made design. Uh, this is the work of Alvaro Siza, uh, the fantastic uh, Portuguese architect. Uh, a set of uh, public swimming pools in Portugal where he actually takes sort of pieces of the landscape and, and it becomes this fantastic uh, form. And people who have been here, of course, report that it's the most, it's the most fabulous swimming pool to, to, to operate in. Another aspect of uh, biophilic design is actually taking biomorphic forms, meaning to say the forms that are found in nature, either literally or abstracting it, Okay, and creating something very, very new. Um, this 
by, by all uh, measures, is no longer new. This is sort of an ancient building, believe it or not. Uh, one of the, the, the icons of late modernism by Eero Saarinen, the TWA building in New York. Uh, it started out as a TWA air terminal. It is now a very expensive hotel, uh, repurposed. Absolutely beautiful. You see sort of the, uh, these forms in nature. Some people say that it's like flying wings. Some people say like it's a giant beetle. Uh, and then on the inside, sort of this uh, very organic sculptural feeling inside has this tremendous feeling of being in a building that actually uh, is quite unusual, away from the rectilinear. Another different form, taking a very different form, uh, is the American architect Faye Jones. Uh, this is uh, the Thorn Crown Chapel, okay? And it takes sort of this very basic form of straight members, no curves, but it begins to mimic sort of a little bit of your experience walking through a forest, right? And you feel this, this intense sort of spirit uh, when you're in there. Uh, fully in keeping with the purpose of the building. Somehow, peace, uh, closeness to nature, transparency, and uh, nature actually unfolding in front of you. Um, in, in Manila, we have our own little versions of this. And uh, sorry to tout our, our, ourselves a little bit. This is a work of my father from many, many years ago, the St. Andrew's Chapel. Uh, sort of this very organic form, somehow turned into sculpture. Um, and, and, and people have a very different feeling than, than, than sort of a, uh, approaching a traditional church. Um, I'll take sort of a set of examples very quickly uh, just to, to, to make the point that these things sort of existed through eons, even beyond that. This is a set of staircases basically from medieval times, right? And uh, you see sort of the structure or the, the references, for instance, to, to seashells or conchs or a nautilus. Uh, some of these things have to do, if, for the more academic, having to do sort of with the golden section or the golden triangle, these proportions, these perfect spirals that have to do. And, and people, uh, human beings, have been actually obsessed over, over many years uh, with this idea of sort of how forms in nature convey a certain sense of belonging, somehow being, uh, even if it's unsaid, um, through the Art Nouveau period. Uh, again, this is, this is just a series of staircases. I'm just showing you a little snippet of an element in buildings, right? It's just a bunch of staircases. Uh, but again, taking forms derived from nature uh, into, into uh, sort of this, this feeling of, uh, of delight and references to nature, somehow being surrounded by it. And in modern times, sort of a more, uh, more uh, uh, sort of, shall we say, stripped down version of that, but all having to do with sort of references to things and forms that you see in nature. And these, these are just the stairs, okay, in, in buildings. Uh, in our own work, um, some of you will be familiar, uh, in, this, in the late 60s, the cultural center in the upper left side, the fabulous staircase that exists, that sort of uh, jellyfish-like set of chandeliers, uh, and more recently, uh, you know, uh, in, in a sort of nod to Faye Jones, the, the stairs on the, on the right side, upper right, it's, it's actually a set of spiral stairs, but they're square in plan and open, almost like sticks in a forest, and very, very transparent. And down below, a project that we're now completing um, in one of the offices here uh, in Manila, um, a joint collaborative project with one of the Singaporean firms, SCDA, uh, taking that idea of a spiral, right? Uh, like a mollusk. Back to buildings. Um, this is the work of uh, Toyo Ito, a Japanese architect. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, a, one of, a media tech in, in Japan. Uh, the, the building, sort of you see the scheme up top, it, it end up, ended up being like an aquarium in the bottom, but the guts of it are almost like part of a vascular system. It's as if you took sort of part of the human body and took sort of the veins and arteries and everything and, and uh, created a building that works in a certain level. The connectivity of floors, uh, the whole idea of a more democratic space. 
the skin of another building that he did, taking the forms of waves, uh, brings all sorts of sort of images and a feeling of well-being, connectivity basically to nature uh, in a certain way. These are, we refer to this essentially as sort of the biomorphic forms that, uh, that happen in biophilic design. Many of you are familiar with the bird's nest, the Olympic Stadium in, in China, um, quite literally. And the work of Santiago Calatrava, the Spanish architect, uh, on, the, on the upper left, sort of the leaf, the leaf patterns, uh, then the transit uh, station in New York, the lower Manhattan, sort of uh, this repetitive but almost skeletal kind of uh, structure, uh, again, looking at nature as an inspiration. I know my five minutes are up, but I'm going to be bad. Okay. Um, uh, another, another one familiar to, to some of you is the work of Zaha Hadid, um, taking this, uh, these fantastic forms, the, the Guangzhou Opera House on the right, and a various set of projects, basically, that take these biophilic, biomorphic forms uh, to great delight. You know? Uh, more recently, the work of Studio Gang in the U.S. Uh, this is called the Aqua Tower, and it recalls sort of the dribbling of sort of how water pours over a surface. Uh, some people can't put a finger, their finger on it, but why they feel a certain way uh, towards the power of this building uh, is something to behold. So. And uh, finally, on the, on the last of this, this is a building from the 1940s, believe it or not. Uh, this is in Mexico a general hospital. The underlying building is from the 40s, but they had to put, because of a smog problem in Mexico, pol massive pollution problem, they wanted to reface and update the building. Okay? What you see here is sort of a, a matrix that's based essentially on the pattern of a brain coral. Okay? But what it is is actually sort of a, uh, some sort of a plastic form okay, that's been coated with a, a very high-tech coating that actually neutralizes uh, nitrous oxide in the atmosphere and removes smog. It neutralizes smog, particulate. And you see sort of a very deliberate design, uh, several layers sort of uh, maximizing the, the surface area to attract these particles. And the coating actually neutralizes them when it's washed off with the rain. It goes into the environment neutral without the acid rain, et cetera, et cetera. So these guys take both biomorphic forms and the biophilic concept kind of to the max. Okay? Harder for us in the Philippines with the budgets that we typically see. Um, so going basically back to the, back to the, uh, to the art fair, uh, ve a very, very quick series of drawings. Um, you see in plan sort of our adoption of sort of uh, the cellular sort of uh, uh, approach to the planning. We, we wanted very much for the art fair to feel very, very different from what you were all used to over the years. The rectilinear efficiency, and, and we only have ourselves to blame because we also did all those art fairs. <laughs> but, but in this one, sort of we wanted to change the game a little bit, okay? We said that walking into a post-pandemic world, it's a question of values, right? You walk into this space, we wanted everything to slow down. We wanted a sense of discovery, that you're not given the entire picture all at once, that the art fair is not necessarily only about the metrics of commercial success or efficiency, but it's also about the art. The art itself, for the gallerists, for the public, the opportunity to go into separate environments and see actually what the creatives can do. Right, an opportunity to actually exploit the cellular form and the ability actually for, for people to really focus on the art okay? and slow down. Let's not hurry through this. There's a lot more to see. The artists have so much more to say than simple sort of review and, and fast walks through. So the plan on the right, then an axonometric drawing basically in the middle showing basically the fourth, fifth, sixth floors. Uh, each of the uh, gallerists were given a mini drawing, a 3D drawing of an axon drawing basically of their space with an opportunity to sort of figure out, it's a measured drawing, so you could figure out the linear spaces of the straight sides, 
figure out what to do with the corners, etc. And as of you, all of you have uh, most likely experienced, some have done it more successfully than others. Okay. Some people sort of really knew what they were doing. They took the geometry into, into, uh, into account. They created little environments for you guys to come into and really you know, became little museum curators themselves of their own little piece, right? This is what we had hoped for. Um, and we also knew from the, from the get-go that it would be liked by some, it would not be liked by others, okay? Um, we did some test perspectives. That's, that's four of something like 60 test perspectives we, we did to, to take a look at what it was going to do. And most importantly, sort of the idea of material. Okay. In, in, in one and a half minutes, I'm going to turn it over to the Rhizome folks, okay, who very generously and, and most amazingly agreed to partner with us in providing some of the material, the fabulous bamboo uh, that you saw. When we, when we say trying to build a better future, trying to build more responsibly, uh, making a carbon footprint sort of uh, sensible, um, you know, the, the idea of carbon capture, et cetera, building sustainably. Uh, this is what the Rhizome guys are attempting to do at a large scale in this country. And hopefully you will realize that uh, sort of as you go along. Um, in the end, sort of this is right just before uh, the exhibition got put together and the finishing happened sort of just a quilt of what those spaces looked like. And you'll see they were fairly close for those cartoony perspectives that we did. Uh, the spaces unfold unexpectedly, much like life, and you're walking through the forest. You walk through life, you're throwing curveballs, you turn the corner, and something unexpected happens. If you walk through some of the best cities in the world, it's your experience of art. If you are in Venice any, or, 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 uh, or, or uh, uh, Shanghai, you walk into certain districts, you have no idea what you're going to come across. You turn a corner, and all of a sudden, amazing things happen. So, <laughs> um, and sort of a, basically a pre-final result of what we were trying to achieve, right? Something different, non-geometric, non-repetitive, much in the way we were all thrown a curveball. Um, and, and hopefully, we ho we're hoping that people sort of engender the idea of thinking about what you're doing and not just going into autopilot and doing things like we all did before. Okay? It's a different world. We have responsibilities. Hope you, you, hopefully, you feel that too. And so here's the, the, my last slide. Uh, for those of you, uh, hopefully, you can read that, that link down at the bottom. But this is the Terrapin Group, okay? uh, a set of consultants, basically, who, uh, who look at the idea of biophilic design. It's a long document, but really worth looking at and absorbing. And hopefully, we build better into the future with a little more responsibility. So with that, thanks very much for listening. Sorry about the five minutes. Thank you, Andy. Those were the best five minutes, <laughs> okay. Um, if you do remember when we were downstairs at the art fair, you go with the flow and as you flow, you have those fantastic bamboo walls, the panels. We have here um, David and Russell and they will introduce themselves and tell you about what they do. Do you have a mic? Testing, testing. Should we go up here? On the... uh, very good. Hello, everybody. My name is Russell. Uh, nice to meet you. Hello. It's good to be here. Um, this is David. Hi. Very good. Nice to meet you. So um, I'm president of Rhizome, and Rhizome's a, we're from the United States, but we have an operation here in the Philippines. We came here a few years ago because we'd heard about this amazing bamboo. Uh, we're bamboo people, we've been working with bamboo around the world, and we'd always heard about this mythical giant bamboo from Mindanao. And finally, in 2018, we came here and we knew immediately that we'd found what we were looking for. 
We'd been looking for the best bamboo to dimensionalize and put into plywood. So we love bamboo for the round format. We you know, love the bamboo poles, but we were looking for a way to take bamboo and make it usable for everyone around the world. And the best way to do that is to sell it as plywood. And so we wanted to find the right bamboo to make uh, big, beautiful panels. And we found it in Mindanao. So we immediately knew we had found the next place for Rhizome to unfold its story, which is about helping the world transition to uh, better, more sustainable building materials and also uh, helping reforest the planet and do a regenerative approach to the way we build and the way we live. So we're here, uh, we're investing our capital, we're investing our shareholders' capitals, we're investing our time and our energy because we love the bamboo of the Philippines. And then as we started working with the bamboo of the Philippines, we uh, fell in love with the people of the Philippines and we have 100 people working for us now in Cagayan de Oro where we're manufacturing uh, bamboo building materials. So it's great to be here. We'll show you a video that tells our story a little bit uh, better than I can, but let me ask David to say hello. Sure, you bet. Uh, so I'm an architect uh, by training and I've been uh, designing, building, and manufacturing uh, uh, with bamboo structurally since, uh, well, 28 years now. Uh, we have a sister company that I'd started called Bamboo Living. And um, the, with that, it was, I guess it was 09, I did a, a presentation in Bangkok at the World Bamboo Congress on bamboo for carbon sequestration. Um, the, what was interesting to me is I had written the paper and about two weeks before the conference, the, uh, the top researcher in the world uh, circulated a paper to the other speakers of why bamboo did not work for carbon sequestration. So I was like, uh-oh. And then I read his paper and I thought, oh my gosh, this is everything we need. This is a, a we address every one of those, oh, I got choked up. Every one of those issues, we've got a really good climate plan, you know. And so that's what we've been implementing. It requires, uh, basically you can't leave bamboo on its own. You, once it's mature, you have to be harvesting it and you have to turn it into durable goods but it is the fastest machine for cleaning up our client probably on the planet, particularly the giants. So you, the, if you go to Guinness Book of World Records, the fastest growing plant on earth is a giant bamboo. It can grow almost three feet a day, so it's uh, you know, a bit under a meter. And uh, so it'll get to 60 to 100 feet tall in just a couple of months. And what's fascinating about it is uh, it, the plant itself can live 120 years, and every year it'll be sending up new shoots. But you need to harvest those shoots to create new sun space as the plant matures. So that's how we keep the high level of carbon sequestration. When uh, we were a, a, a top 60 finalist for the uh, XPRIZE carbon removal um, competition, and, um, and when we ran the numbers for that, realized that the conversion of just 12% of global construction to, to <laughs> it's, it's a big goal. It's 12% of global construction converted to bamboo would address one third of human emissions annually. Every year it would clean up our environment, clean up our atmosphere. And, uh, Philippines, you know, you have the bamboo, you have the climate, you've got incredible architects, um, you know, again, already using the material, and it's really about uh, taking it to the next level. Um, your former Secretary of Agriculture joined our board last summer, and within a month or so, he, he came back and said, hey, I've got arranged a million hectares that need reforestation, um, and we'll create a, a, a bamboo... Um, supply chain that will lift people out of poverty. It'll, uh, it, it's, it's really going to help. <laughs> that one project will address between one and one and a half percent of total global emissions every year once it's been implemented in, in the first, after the first decade. So that's what we're on for. Very good. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, we're going to do a quick video that tells our story succinctly and then we'll 
uh, give a little bit of a demo of how we take bamboo and turn it into structural building materials. Great. Trees are essential to life as we know it. Trees produce the oxygen we breathe, absorb the carbon dioxide we exhale, as well as what's generated when we heat our homes, drive our cars, or cook our food. Trees mitigate climate change. Trees also absorb rain, provide water, and improve our soil. Yet, we chop down 15 billion trees every year, about 24.7 million acres of forest. That's about the size of Portugal, the size of a football field every six seconds. Half of the trees that are cut down are used by the construction industry. We can't grow trees fast enough, and the demand continues. So we at Rhizome like to think that we're in the business of saving trees. We're doing it with bamboo, the tree that's not a tree. In fact, it's a grass. Yet, it's strong like steel, as beautiful as any hardwood, and it matures in three to five years versus 20 to 60 for trees. Best of all, bamboo keeps giving. You can harvest every year for 70 to 100 years. When a tree is cut down, it's dead. Until now, there's never been a reliable supply chain of the right bamboo. Rhizome is addressing that. Rhizome is cultivating giant bamboo species that meet the needs of the construction industry. We've worked out the designs, perfected the prototypes, and the process for bamboo building products. We began shipping this year from our first manufacturing plant in the Philippines, where giant bamboo thrives. Now, we're deploying our technologies and methodologies to meet demand in North America. Together with citrus farmers in Florida, we're planting giant bamboo, giving them a new cash crop to replace the citrus trees that were decimated by insects. And with every acre of bamboo that we plant, we're drawing down carbon to help heal the planet. Plant bamboo, make lumber, sequester billions of tons of carbon dioxide. This is what we do. Rhizome is the building product that the world has been waiting for. Rhizome, the miracle timber is here. And not a minute too soon. So we probably have one minute left. Yeah, um, we call it the miracle timber for so many reasons. The, the bamboo, you know, as David said, you plant it once, it grows for a hundred years. You cut a pole and two poles come back. If you keep cutting the poles, it keeps giving you more. Then from every pole, we get about 20 additional bamboo plants from the branch cutting. So it's this exponential magic gift from the gods and we just sum it up as a miracle. And then you can take the bamboo and you, it's as strong as steel. It's got the compression strength of concrete. You can form it into beams, into columns, into posts, into panels. And then as Dave was communicating, we're sequestering 150 pounds of carbon in each four by eight sheet of uh, plywood. And then we sequester that carbon for the long term because we're going to put it into buildings that Andy's going to build and that Christian's going to build and that you all are going to live in, you're going to worship in, you're going to go to the casino in, whatever you're going to do, you're actually going to be living um, a solution to the, car the climate uh, problem by helping us build with bamboo and sequester carbon for the long term. So we're happy to talk about it. We love that we are invited to be part of the art fair. And uh, please visit us out here, and we'll tell you more about how we take uh, the beautiful bamboo and turn it into uh, structural building materials. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Russell. Thank you, David. Um, our next speaker is Chris Chan. Yes, Sanandanan. He is a young architect and a graduate from the University of Santo Tomas. And he specializes in using bamboo in all his projects. Chris Chan, please. Thank you very much, Dina. Um, I'll go up the stage because I'm a bit short, so that you'll see me. So good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Christian Salandanan, and um, um, I'm part of the firm Sangai Architects. Basically, we're an architectural firm that focuses on um, bamboo architecture, utilizing bamboo on our design, um, but pushing it always to the limit in such a way that we get to think of how do we utilize bamboo more and um, how do we integrate design and this old material to come up with something that is um, a bit of contemporary and more innovative. Thank you for the clicker, yeah. 
I'll be particular as well with the time, don't worry. Thank you. So I'll start with this. Um, what comes to our mind when we hear the word bamboo? Most often than not, these are, these are good for chopsticks, toothpick, fencing, bahay kubo, or the hut, right? These are the things that comes to our mind uh, when we hear the word bamboo or when we see bamboo. But um, this is also one of the most saddest things that, um, that stuck me uh, and that we remember with bamboo. Uh, when, when we say bamboo, it's always associ associated with, it's a poor man's material. And um, I still re I vividly remember we have one project, a socialized housing project. Um, one of the benefici beneficiaries told us that, oh, we're already poor and yet you're still going to use bamboo for us. So it's like um, an insult to them or they feel like being demoralized by using bamboo. And that stuck with me, but that also made, um, that also served as one of our inspiration and raised a question of, is bamboo really the problem? Is the material really the problem? Or is it how we utilize them? And the question arises that, are we, are we really maximizing the potential of bamboo in, the, in our industry? And I challenge everyone and, um, um, because I believe that we have uh, the power, both the power and responsibility to actually elevate this material as simple as through a good design, through good design. And um, just to show quickly how other countries are actually utilizing it. Uh, say, for example, this is in Vietnam uh, by Votrong Nia Architects. You see how they used um, bundled bamboos in their interiors. This is Ulaman Eco Retreat Resort in Indonesia by Inspiral Architects. This is um, Green Village by Ibuku. This is a six-story high um, residential uh, structure. Six stories, everything above ground made out of bamboo. And this is their latest work, the Ark, um, just recently completed. And this is how the interior looks like. See the scale of um, human versus the building. And you see how they utilized grid shell um, form of bamboo into, in, as a part of the structural component. And let's go back to how we utilize it here in the Philippines. It's the Bahay Kubo. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against Bahay Kubo. Um, it's been part of our culture already. What I'm against is, is the mentality that bamboo can just be Bahay Kubo. I believe there's more to it. I believe there's, uh, we can do more with this material. And um, as mentioned a while ago, it's basically bamboo needs only four to seven years for it to be harvested and be ready for construction purposes. We have a lot of really, really good species with bamboo. This is giant bamboo here in the Philippines. See the scale, really, this is me, way back 2016. And I see the scale of this giant bamboo. It grows really, really tall, 20, 30 meters. Uh, we have here botong, patong, some examples of uh, Bamboo and the famous Kawayan Tinik. And um, you see how, uh, just to, be sh to share uh, some of, our, of the things that we do. Say, for example, this is um, a lagoon where um, there's a need to do a yoga pavilion. And this is uh, what we came up with. Uh, basically, a structure around in form, standing on concrete pedestals and arrayed on circular manner. But um, all the structural components are made out of, um, of bamboo. And um, another, another one is, um, is the church. Um, it's a church in, one of the church in El Nido. So again, it's mixing not totally uh, all bamboo, but mixing it with other innovative materials. Again, to make it socially acceptable, to come up with a more, um, a more contemporary fitting um, experience in terms of design. And also to always explore, meaning push the limit of bamboo. And one of the things is actually um, the things that Rhizome is doing to turn it into other byproducts, uh, such as cro um, the paneled bamboo or cross-laminated bamboo. Say, for example, for this um, uh, project that we're doing, it's mixing cross-laminated bamboo with other materials. And curving bamboo as well uh, into its round form, um, again, to come up with um, a different, to push the limit of what, what other spaces, how, how can we craft spaces um, using this material. 
And there's a question of, kano ba siya katagal? How long will it last? Um, with the proper design and the proper treatment, can easily last 25 years. Okay. So, okay. I think it's okay. So, <laughs> so yeah, but, uh, but again, uh, with the proper treatment, just showing that uh, proper treatment, <laughs> um, using proper stacking, and uh, as we do the still, uh, the traditional of um, dipping method, dipping it on um, a, a treatment solution, because we produce on um, a, a smaller scale than, uh, than what rhizome is doing. But these are still giant bamboos. And I'd like to, uh, I'd like to actually, um, uh, these are the last few slides. Um, I'd like to share with you this project. This is a Polo, MLR Polo uh, Pavilion. It was used during the 2019 um, Sea Games. And as I mentioned a while ago, one of the things that um, we got inspired of and really was challenged was um, when one of the one of uh, bene beneficiaries said that bamboo is just for poor man's material, and this project is actually um, perfect in a way that the project owner told us that we wanted to create a pavilion to actually host the VIPs, to actually host um, uh, the kings uh, and sultans of uh, Southeast Asian countries, but we want to use bamboo as a building material. Quite ironic. Uh, to use poor man's material to cater for uh, the royalties. And this is one good opportunity to show that um, with a good design or with a proper uh, um, utilization of the material, you can actually come up with a better, um, a better, uh, spa with better spaces. This is um, the pavilion. And during the, con uh, one of the things that um, I'm really happy with bamboo is it involves people to learn something new. Um, people actually take pride in what they do. I remember one, um, a group of workers, after they finish the structure, they're standing, at, um, they're standing at a distance from the structure, looking at it at night, um, and then they were very proud. Kami um, Gamoanian, we are the ones who actually built that. And that for me is a very beautiful one, of them taking pride of what they do. And, um, this is the final product. So this is um, a pavilion. Again, it's a mix of, uh, of different materials, a mix of um, concrete pedestals, and everything on top is um, all bamboo. It's looking towards this um, polo playing field. And um, in terms of joints, we use stainless steel balls always to connect um, bamboo poles to another. We don't use slashing. Um, again, um, one of the things, if you notice, one of the failures always of bamboo um, design is at its connection. So if we try to innovate that, then we can come up with a better, um, more durable design. And um, this is the entrada um, of it upon entering. So it's a mix of, um, of glass stones and different materials. And if well um, considered as well with lighting, uh, you can really come up with um, um, a beautiful ambiance inside. And that's 10 minutes, sorry. but. Um, this is the last presentation of, I'd like to challenge everyone that, again, each and every one of us can actually create and um, create beautiful spaces with bamboo because we have both the power and responsibility. And it's as simple as having a good design. So I challenge everyone to let's all play a role and build beautiful structures, one bamboo at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Can I call all the speakers up on stage so that we can have an open forum? Can I sit? I'll sit here. Uh, okay. David, Russell, Andy. No, I'll stay down here. <laughs> okay. Um, I, for one, when I entered the fair, and I walked, and I went through the flow, I mean, you just flow, and you get into this space that you're surrounded by bamboo panels, and then as you enter an opening, you're into a, a gallery. And so that's a different space, and it's, and it's, um, it's busy, people are interacting, but as you step out by the bamboo, um, I don't know what you call it. It's like a, 
It's like a rotonda. It's like a, a common space. It's so quiet. And I, I think that was um, the contrast that I never did see in the, um, in the past fairs before. And I think that was the, um, I, I don't know if that's what you wanted to achieve with the um, layout, but I, I did feel that it was a good change. It was a good change. And when you're surrounded by bamboo, compared to maybe the concreteness of the floor and all these things, it, it gives you a softness and, and you're, you're like at home. Do you agree? Yeah, it's a funny thing. Uh, there was a duality issue uh, when we were trying to figure out what was what, uh, what the elements were. What was very clear to us was uh, we set the social areas. We referred to them as the social areas, uh, the public areas, basically up as bamboo lined. And then the galleries had their own individual environments. And we said two things can happen. It's either people poke into the galleries and they come out and become social in the bamboo areas, sort yeah. of the public areas, the or exactly the opposite happens, the which are both actually completely acceptable. Okay. Okay. The, the codification is that we wanted uh, people to, to sort of acknowledge that when you stepped out of the, uh, of the individual pods, that you were in a different zone. Correct. Right? Correct. How people would react was sort of a little bit of a science experiment. <laughs> and uh, I think for, for us, it's, um, these are the risks, the design risks that we think are worth taking. Correct. And, and, and uh, our feedback as well is when people walked into sort of the public zones and the, the uh, corridors, the, the social spaces, sort of people get this reprieve, Correct. right, from the intensity actually of the, uh, of the pods, which That's is uh, a really kind of for us a great result. I know, right. I know. On the contrary, what happened was the contrary. Yeah. I mean, when you're outside in the social space, it's very quiet. Right. Do you all agree? Anyone has a, a comment, would like to comment on that? Yes, please. We're all creatures of habit. We're very used to Sorry, we're all creatures of habit. We live in rectangular spaces. Human beings are very slow to change. You know, that's one of the big challenges. How do you think we can get people to adapt to this new kind of modular design that works so well to make it more comfortable to have quiet as well as you know a conversation and activity? Correct. Anyone want to take that? Want me to Christian, Christian, can you can you comment on that? Oh. How do you uh, work on the space to introduce something new in terms of form? Okay. It's always a challenge to actually introduce something new, I agree with, with people. But um, most often than not, and this is one actually good example, is um, when people start to actually feel it, when people start to actually feel the space, then they begin to, to actually slowly accept it. But if it's just the idea initial, uh, majority of the people are actually a bit hesitant. But um, I, I believe it's partly with the material of um, of people are innately somehow connected with natural materials such as bamboo. Um, so it's the, yeah. the softness and the pliability yes. of a bamboo. When you're talking about yes. bamboo in yes. space, when yes. you surround the space with bamboo, you feel, you feel that connected with it. Yeah. people feel connected. Yeah. How about you, Andy? Uh, let me go directly, sort of the, the absolute Correct. question is how yes. uh, it's a layout issue Correct. and sort of the issue of rectilinearity versus the sinewy Correct. sort of environment. Uh, I would urge you all, actually, uh, when you're back down, when you go back down to the art fair space, um, also an expected, an expected result was that some people would get it. In, in common parlance, magigets ng iba. Some people would get the idea. Some people would resist or, or not be exactly sure what to do. But what is so, so clear is when you get down there, you will see that some gallerists sort of actually exploited the quality of the pods or that cellular structure and created incredible environments. They knew how to set up the art. They used the curves beautifully away from the, rectilin the usual rectilinear spaces. So what you're seeing down there is sort of is a, mix a mixture and an unexpected 
mixture of successes and some people who are less sort of comfortable with it, right? I think from, from the architect's point of view, from the designer's point of view, take your cue off the guys who knew what to do. I and have a question for you. Was, did it have anything, it's a mindset, right? It is. Does it, it is. have anything to do with um, age? There's, I, I, I think you can ask the art fair guys about this <laughs> because that's the initial feedback. Some of the younger, smaller galleries somehow embraced it, okay? And it's a result, uh, some of the smallest galleries, especially the guys on the seventh floor, I have to point out this from a personal point of view, okay? You come out of the elevators, they're there on the right, the guys on the seventh floor, there are five little galleries, okay? Just embraced it in total and realized what the implications are of a continuous sort of curvilinear sort of space. There's straight sides, but the, but the corners, right? They, they actually created an environment where they actually painted murals on the wall. So there's a narrative on the wall. They, as they say here, nuggets nila. They, they got this idea of sort of uh, just being informed by the layout, okay? I think that's where you look for sort of, uh, shall we say, buy-in. Going back to your question, uh, rectilinearity is good because it's, there's efficiency. familiarity and efficiency and neutrality to some degree, okay? But the world isn't neutral. We're completely okay with introducing something that makes people think. Uh, the more aware we are of sort of the possibilities out there, the richer actually our built environment becomes. And for us, that's what, what it's about. Push yeah. it. Pushing it to the level. And now, since we're talking about things that are new, we also have bamboo that is, well, it's relatively new. It's actually very new in the Philippines. And as a building material, it solves a lot of problems. Yeah, that's uh, exactly it. Is, uh, and as Andy said, is uh, one of the things that, that uh, has come out of this pandemic is the recognition that we can't continue with business as usual. And, uh, you know, it's really a time uh, at a planetary level. This is the first crisis that we've experienced as a planet, you know, is the pandemic. Uh, you know, it's fast moving. So it was very easy to say, okay, well, we need to respond to it. Well, the big one underlying all of this is the climate crisis, and it's driving the, the uh, epidemic process as well. So um, looking at, at, you know, how do we address, it's, it's almost in trying to understand geologic time. You know, things change slowly, but they're changing all the time. I, I was at Zion Park many years ago, and they showed the uh, geological history of the United States. It looked like water on a piece of glass. It's like land moves, it comes, you know, the water, the seas move in. Um, and, you know, we're in a position now where the seas are moving in unless we do something about it. You know, I grew up in a state where the highest spot in the state was right near my family's home. It was 200 feet above sea level and it takes an hour and a half to get there from the coast. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's critical that we address this. And it's also, at the same time, there's a crisis. There's um, the, they, they say that the, that the Chinese character for crisis also incorporates the, the character for opportunity. And that, I feel like that's where we are. And that's I, where we are yeah, right now. Yeah. So um, any more questions as we uh, go through life with all these changes? Positive change is good. Any, anyone? None, none of us here bite. <laughs> it's are, okay. we, are we good with okay time? Ask, but... What's our time? We're good with time. We still have 30 minutes. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So well, now, no, okay. Well, well, here's a statement. Uh, it's just a joke, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> seriously. <laughs> um, is uh, saving the world, why do it if it's not fun? You know? Like, really, life should be fun and enjoyable and you know, an adventure. 
And what I say is we're on a climate adventure, and so we all need to jump in and figure out how to make it happen. I agree with that. And I, I think we need uh, the youth, the young children. I mean, yeah. oh, yes. Do you want to say something? Hello. I have a question with regards to your product, the bamboo. Uh, have you marketed this? Uh, this is my first time to hear about your company. Do you have plans to market it locally and internationally? And uh, that's my question. Yeah, yeah I, uh, we, we just turned our press on in November of this year, or last year, so it's uh, relatively new for us to be bringing the finished product to the market. And we set up the company thinking we were exporting. So we came from the United States, we thought oh, we're gonna come here and we're gonna take it back to the distributors in the United States. But it's not, it's all coming here into Manila, to Davao, to Cebu City. It's like the, the need and the demand for uh, building materials in Philippines is big as anywhere. Today, 80% of your wood products are imported from China or That's Indonesia. That's true. 80%. And you have the finest, most amazing fiber across your entire island chains, right? So we did think we were exporting, but right now we're mostly uh, deploying it here. So and, I have yeah. a question. So instead of, like, what percentage of your production is for local domestic sale? We, when, we, when we set up our business with BIR and everybody else, we said it was going to be 80% right. export, 80 company. export, 20% local, but it's the other way around. Wow. Right now, 80% of our materials coming to Davao, Hotel 101, Double Dragon, uh, beautiful resorts being and built. And these are being Gaitai. used as wall panels? Everything. Wall panels, beams, wow. structural oh, beams. Oh, I have a question. Do yeah. you use them for floors too? The Hotel 101 is putting it in their uh, public spaces as floors. In the public spaces. Yeah. Oh. And it, we're, it's since November. <laughs> so we were like, okay. Um, Not even a year. No. And then uh, we met Andy, right? and Andy's like, just about the same time all of you were figuring out what to do with the, the oh. art fair post-pandemic, right? And we meet and we're like, well, you know, is there a way we could help, right? Tell the story about biophilic design, natural processes. And Andy was like, well, maybe, right? What can you do with bamboo? We said, well, we can make it curve. And we can also make it straight. We can make it strong. We can make it flexible. So for us, this is an opportunity for us to let everyone here know that, okay, rhizome is part of it, but it's really everyone here because it's Philippine bamboo, it's the best in the world. There's a complete opportunity to reforest the Philippines with reforestation 2.0. Wait, Russell, and that is for real. The bamboo here is the best It's in the amazing. World. Okay. I've been all over, David's been all over. We've all been, over. We've been yeah, up in the over. Amazon. I can't tell you one story real fast. So we're, we did this in Amazon, and then we had to fly in a plane for hours. We landed on a dirt strip. The bamboo was going to be shipped down a river to a pre-processing site, then put in a container and shipped to another river to get into an ocean container. And then, you know, it was just this long supply chain. We come here, we land in uh, Caganduro, we stop at uh, Coffee Bean, we get a coffee. We take a SUV up to Manola Fortage. There's bamboo all along the road, and it's the biggest bamboo we've ever seen, and it's everywhere. And then we can dri drive it down to our factory in 45 minutes. So when you look at the possibilities of doing business in the Philippines, using your natural advantages of your bamboo, your climate, your people, your location, it's the place for bamboo to scale. And right. that's why we're putting our capital in here and we invite you to help us. We, we need customers, we need architects, we need to make this happen together. Thank you. Any more questions? Hofer, nobody? I'd like okay. to add up on, on, yes, um, yes, on that rhizome. Actually, it's an advantage now with, with, um, with the emergence of rhizome because the past years, a lot of architects and designers um, actually wanted, there, there are a lot of architects who wanted to create um, projects with bamboo, products with bamboo, designs with bamboo, but it always hit, I mean, the end of the wall as to how do we implement it? Who will implement it? And it's always a question of quality. Someone can but not to the acceptable quality, quality that it will push to the limit or it will be acceptable enough. You know, creativity-wise, it's always the implementation, the implementation side, at least with bamboo industry, is always yes, the bottleneck. Because, yeah. Correct, because for now, as a building material, I, I mean, it's not a new building material, okay. but it's the reintroduction of bamboo is the newest, is the new thing yeah. in, in our world. So. I think that's where the difficulty is coming in. I mean, you have to establish good uh, details for bamboo, I mean, architecturally or design-wise. Sure. Well, um, I started uh, 
designing and building with bamboo I mentioned 28 years ago, and our houses are still in pretty much perfect shape after 28 years. So, you know, we see these things lasting for centuries, and we're designing for that. So we're thinking about, you know, again, it's an organic material, and but there's also new products that were coming out that are designed for siding, for outdoor decking, you know, for it's outdoor really... Outdoor decking, too. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. So we're really? just, you know, it's a, it's a progress thing, but step by step. Our, our next press comes in and should be operational by June, and that's where we're going to densify the bamboo. So now we're milling it into beautiful strips, but the next step is densification. So we densify the bamboo into a 4 by 8 panel that's designed to be for exterior applications, and so that's why we have this sky tower uh, picture behind our uh, place here, because we're serious yeah. about it. Yeah. Serious about it. Okay. Yeah. And, so and, and structurally, it is a phenomenal material. It's, uh, I know, the, I heard. Right, I right. Mean, it is the, there's, the there's science a, part. Yeah. There's a, a group in UK that did the analysis for a 50-story bamboo building. You know, that's, that's skyscraper level that we're going to. I'm, in May, I'm doing a, a, a joint talk with Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill that did the Berge Khalif. You know, everybody's looking for you know, this next material, like where do we move from here? And so there's excitement about it. And we're so excited to be engaging with Andy on this as a launch project for us. So thank you. So we're all looking forward to having um, structures in bamboo that are going to beautify, not only beautify, but also help the environment in the Philippines because it is the only grass that grows so fast and it can help save the environment. We have a new building material. It, you can make skyscrapers. And guess what? It's anti-free, correct? I mean, there are no termites because they, they suck out the sugar, and therefore the termites don't like the bamboo. So please. Someone said it was sugar-free. It's sugar-free. <laughs> <laughs> See, so it's fashionable, it's sugar-free. So on that note, um, I would like to thank everyone Yes, Christian, Russell, Andy, and um, David, David yeah, for this afternoon. Anything, uh, any, any more questions? So when you go down, oh, one more, okay. So speaking of, bam oh. speaking of bamboo as a relatively new material, do we also see it in like colder, do we possibly see it in colder climates? Like how is it insulating material, I mean uh, property, like can it, be a good insulator? How can it handle, yeah, basically how can it handle like colder climates? Is it possible to do so? Yeah, the bamboo itself can, especially if we make it durable, right, by processing. But it's not really an insulation material, so we still work with other materials, whether, For you instance. know, so it, it's not all or nothing, it's together. Yeah. Hi, yeah, I really want to commend your material, um, but my question is, in terms of affordability, as much as we want to kind of um, reach out to those who can actually afford it, or the general problem, uh, general public. Yeah, that, that, so there's a there's a stage to this, right? As we scale production, it's going to be the lowest price building material on the planet, and it's that way because you plant the rhizome once and it grows for hundreds of years. You cut the grass every year and it grows right back. So if you think about that from an economic standpoint, it's, a, it's, a, it's got the first principles to be the lowest price building material. Today it's not. Today we're uh, equivalent with NARA, which for us was really great. We were, like, we're one press, right? We're getting started and our price point is already at NARA. And why is that? It's because it's affordable for us to harvest. There's a really great work uh, ethic here in the Philippines. Our employees are really productive. And so you put those together and right now we're equivalent with NARA. But the most exciting part for us was that we're actually lower priced than steel. So today, people are telling us that our bamboo beams are priced parity or lower than steel. So it's going to be an evolution as we uh, build up scale. But I, in my opinion, it will be the lowest priced building material on the planet. Yeah, that's our goal. Yeah. Happy with that. Miracle bamboo. <laughs> So I have a question. When you say it's a structural material, yeah. when you put your joints or li like a truss, yeah. it's strong enough? Yeah, David should tell you that. Sure, yeah. So um, I've been designing with it, uh, you know, for, like I said, 28 years. We took it through the U.S. building codes uh, process. 
And our buildings have withstood multiple Category 5 hurricanes, 200 mile an hour winds in multiple situations. Amazing. And we're up to 6.9 on the Richter scale. You know, honestly, as we're looking forward, um, I was at IIT in Delhi years ago. They, they were testing after initial failure. With initial failure with concrete and steel are catastrophic. You saw that in Turkey and yes. Syria. Um, what happens yeah. with the bamboo, it's not that way. You get structural damage, but the building will stay up. And so you're not going to get the pancake kind of thing. Really not? Yeah, yeah. OK, there you go. You have a structural material in bamboo, and it's grown in the Philippines and made in the Philippines. So um, does anyone have anything that they would like to clarify? None? OK. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.